Wild Lives by Phonographic. Hey, I'm Rochelle and welcome to Wild Lives by Phonographic. Today we're chatting to my dear mate Justin Hawko, who today works as a whale naturalist here in Sydney, but he spent most of his career in Newfoundland where he was born. Now, Newfoundland is renowned for being a whale hotspot as well as for its 10,000-year-old icebergs and also it's known as the seabird capital of North America because 35 million seabirds flock to the area every year to breed. Justin has nearly 20 years of working as a naturalist under his belt and most of his experience is in the Whitless Bay Ecological Reserve of Newfoundland. Located close to St John's in Newfoundland, the Whitless Bay Ecological Reserve consists of four islands, Great Island, Pee Island, Gull Island and Green Island. The area is a haven for seabirds with thriving populations of leeches, storm petrels, razor-billed orcs, shearwaters, northern gannets and a range of gulls. And it's here you'll also find North America's largest colony of Atlantic puffins, It's a population of more than half a million, or 260,000 breeding pairs. Each year, after spending autumn and winter alone at sea, the puffins return to the land to catch up with their breeding partner, their monogamous. And it's during this time their beaks change colour from the dull grey they wear in winter to a vibrant yellow and orange colour to keep their partners keen. And while puffins only measure around 25 centimetres in length, and weigh about the same as a can of drink, they're able to carry quite a few fish in their beaks thanks to their raspy tongues and spiny palates. And with their comical looks and big personalities, they're sometimes referred to as the clowns of the sea. Hey Justin, how are you going? I'm good, great to be here, thanks. Thanks for catching up with me after a day on the high seas. You've literally seen hundreds of thousands of puffins throughout your career. What's the most surprising thing you've learned about them? I think for me, it's uh, just what creatures of habit they are. Uh, They return to the same islands every single year, probably the same islands that they were born on. And better than that, they actually will return to the exact same burrow every single year to uh, lay their eggs and raise their chicks year in, year out. Mm. Yeah. So I've heard that puffins are monogamous, which means they mate for life. Do they all share the work when it comes to co-parenting and things like that? Like, how does their family structure work? Yeah, so they're, they're, they're definitely into sharing the load. Obviously, mom has to do quite a bit of work up front. She's got to uh, carry and then, of course, lay the egg, which is probably about a third of the size of her oh, body. It is, really? It's a massive thing. But once the egg is out, there will always be mom or dad at home. And whoever's at home, the other one will be out fishing to, to get sustenance for themselves, for their mate at home. And eventually, once the chick hatches from the egg, uh, they'll be taking turns to make sure that chick is very, very well fed. And they do, they do a phenomenal job at it. You know, there's, there's apocryphal stories. We won't, uh, you know, we won't call it fact or anything, but uh, of puffin chicks getting so well fed that uh, when it t- comes time for them to fledge the nest, sometimes it's a bit of an ordeal just getting through the front door. Uh, they, they get, as long as the bait is there, they get very, very well fed, very fat, very happy, and there's always somebody home to protect them. Is there just one chick per breeding season, or do they have a few at a time? They only get one egg a year. As I said, it's, it's a massive egg, so mom can only carry one at a time, but it isn't unheard of for them to lay another egg if the first lay is unsuccessful or the chick doesn't make it as long as it's early enough in the season there is a chance that they can go for a second lay but the later and later they push it the higher the chance of mortality comes for the chick right because they time the laying of their eggs and therefore the hatching of the chicks to kind of come into sync with the high point of the available bait uh, which for us is called capelin. It's a small six-inch silver fish. They also uh, quite heavily eat sand eels, or as we call them, sand lance. But they have to time the laying and the hatching of the chick to the best possible bait to ensure the highest likelihood of survival for the chick. So as it becomes later, the bait becomes scarcer and scarcer, and the likelihood the chick will survive becomes less and less. 
I've heard that they're called the clowns of the sea because they're pretty freaking unco. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about that. What's what's all that about? Uh, certainly on the land and in the air, they are extraordinarily uncoordinated. They have uh, a funny way of walking. I call it the puff and shuffle. Um, it's they're, they're not great at walking, and they're terrible flyers. Uh, they they remind me of you know the little wind up ducks that you play with in the bath. Very stiff wing, very mechanical looking. Two to three hundred beats per minute is what it takes to keep them in the sky, and they can't take off from a flat surface that isn't water. So if they're on flat ground, that's that's it. They they. Yeah, they have to fall, exactly. All, all puff and takeoffs are controlled falls. <laughs> you, you heave yourself off the steepest thing you can find, flap your wings and pray. That's, that's how it goes. And, and as a result, you will never find puffins nesting on flat ground. They always seek out big, steep slopes or the edges of cliffs uh, for, their, for their burrowing and for their nesting. How do they get back up then? Well, from the water, it's a different story. Um, like many seabirds, they do struggle with taking off but on the water they kind of <laughs> it's actually really humorous to watch they will they will flap their wings and skip along on their bellies and they will always 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 take off into the wind by maximizing the airflow over top of the wing you maximize lift so by by doing this and, and getting themselves moving and then you just all you need is once you're going into the wind and you got some momentum up, you just need an appropriately placed wave to give you that little kick up into the air, and then they can really start flying, and and they can slowly, slowly gain altitude. You watch them when they're when they're going away from the island out to fish. They're always very, very low to the water because they've launched themselves off the cliff, and they've done this big downward arc. And they will slowly get back up to an altitude, but it takes them miles and miles to get back up to the altitude that's required to actually get back up onto the land. So when they come back, they're very, very high, and they'll slowly spiral down to the appropriate height, appropriate altitude. But, yeah, they're, they're incredibly uncoordinated until they get into the water. Now, puffins are phenomenal divers, and they, they fly underwater much better than they fly above it. They propel themselves with their wings. They can probably get down uh, certainly greater than 60 meters underwater. Really? Yeah, on, a, on about a two-minute dive, they can get down to 60 meters, fish, and get back up. Um, and I think, I think in some cases up to maybe about 70, 75 meters, but there's a little bit of, obviously, argumentation about that. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. So do puffins have any predators? What are their biggest threats? Uh, bar none, the biggest threat, at least in terms of predation for puffins, are what we call great blackback seagulls. Uh, the blackbacks are the biggest species of seagull in the world. We're talking, you know, birds with wingspans that are, on average, something like five and a half feet. So, you know, one point, we'll call it 1.5 meters, something like that. Massive, massive birds, and they're mean. Uh, and they're not just scavengers, as we think of many seagulls to be nowadays. These are predatory, and they specialize, uh, certain groups of them anyway, specialize in hunting puffins. Not just chicks, full adults. They, they'll, they'll, yeah, they, have, they have the ability, they're, they're big enough, they're strong enough, and they, have, they develop techniques which they pass on to their chicks in how to grab puffins, both on land and in the water, and different techniques to subdue them and ultimately kill them and eat them. Uh, on average, the the blackbacks that are that undertake predation upon puffins are probably eating at least one a day. Now, obviously, Whoa. yeah, obviously a much lower population of these blackbacks than there are puffins. There's there's lots of puffins to go around. We have probably in the Whitless Bay Ecological Reserve probably about three hundred thousand pairs versus maybe 300 or so pairs of greater blackback. So are they actually eating the whole puffin in one day? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. They, they, will, they mostly go for the internals. They'll pull them apart. Uh, but if it's a chick, it'll be down the hatch in one swallow. That's it. They're just, yeah, just right down the hatch. They don't pull it apart or anything like that. They'll just swallow it whole. Gangsters, yeah. man. <laughs> Tell us your favorite puffin story. Ah, 
My favorite puffin story relates to how surprisingly savage they are. I have been bitten quite badly by puffins, and any okay, well, any anybody who does research on puffins, which is not me, I, I don't go on the island and and you know do egg counts and things like that. These people have absolute nerves of steel because puffins' beaks, while they're they're beautiful, brightly colored things, are also exceptionally sharp. They are lined with small barb-like teeth on the roof of the mouth and also the tongue for when they catch prey these barbs face backwards into the throat so they can hold prey and the prey can't escape once it's in there and it's pinched between the tongue and the roof of the mouth you're not going anywhere turns out humans are very very similar (laughs) until the puffin decides that it's going to let you go you're not getting away Um, so I was bitten one day we had a puffin fly into the aerial again not very coordinated they flew into the aerial on the boat and they ended up coming down and landing on the deck he was a bit shell-shocked i managed to get my coat over top of him or her Uh, but once i picked up the puffin i uncovered the head and my hand was in the wrong spot and it latched on to my pointer finger on my left hand and he was not letting go I, I literally had to take the puffin to the side of the boat and throw it up into the air. And once he knew he was getting thrown up into the air, he finally let go. Yeah. And you'll see the same kind of behavior with the gulls as well. If the gulls come in and threaten the puffins, the puffins will latch on to whatever they can and pull and rip and tear to just try and, you know, try and get away or at the very least make it as hard as possible on the seagull. Tough little buggers, eh? <laughs> Newfoundland is also famous for its northern gannets, and at 110 centimetres, they're the area's largest seabirds. While gannets spend most of their lives at sea, in breeding season, they return to the sea cliffs in their thousands, where they mate with the same partner every year. Gannets are renowned for their agro behaviour towards each other as they compete for food and space, and also for their distinctive hunting technique, which sees them torpedo into the water to catch their prey. So northern gannets are pretty death-defying. They can dive from a height of 30 metres, hit the water at 100 k's an hour when they're fishing. How can they survive that kind of impact? Okay, so gannets, first off, I have to say gannets are probably my favourite seabird going because of exactly what you're talking about, just the the, the enormous speed they gather before they hit the water. Um, They've got a, a few adaptations that allow them to do that. Um, obviously hitting water at that speed <clears throat> it's not like you're you know just jumping off the side of the pool into the water it, you're basically flying into concrete and uh, so the number one adaptation they have protects the brain from the concussive force they have a, a spongy piece of bone right at the base of the beak that acts as a cushion to absorb some of that that concussive force also Virtually every bone in their body, especially the beak, the skull, the breastbone, is very, very heavily reinforced. They're actually very heavy bones, surprisingly heavy for a bird. They also, like you know, any good car, come absolutely fully loaded, and they've got they've got uh, airbags built in. So through their sternum, their underparts, their sides, they have these air sacs that at the moment of impact or milliseconds before the moment of impact they can force air out of their lungs through muscular contractions and into these air sacs which inflate just like an airbag to cushion the force on the body plus there's a techniquey thing that they do and it's just as they hit the water they streamline everything they straighten the neck the wings fold back across the back and they become basically an arrow and they hit hit the water beak first so that streamlining also minimizes the profile minimizes the amount of uh, surface area that's actually hitting the water and gives them a rip entry like just a perfect bubble entry yeah that's crazy yeah they're they're beautiful i just need to interrupt for a second and just let the listeners know that we are actually down at darling harbor and what you can hear is a screaming child in the background but you know (laughs) so We've kind of established that gannets are pretty freaking gangster. They're fast, powerful. They can steal food from other birds and often from boats as well. They are also super ruthless towards each other. We've talked about this before. You've told me some awesome stories. Tell me about some of these gangster behaviours between birds. 
Well, I mean, there's a couple of things I can tell you. Even if you just go to their rookeries, their their breeding colonies, they are always, always, always beaking at one another. I had an interesting experience myself one time. We had one that it was probably becalmed and ended up kind of coming up onto the land near where I worked. So me being me, I had to go take a closer look. And I got down amongst the rocks, big armor stones, lots of cover. And I had a, a pretty big boulder between me and the gannet. And I just wanted to get a better look. So I kind of craned my neck up over top of the boulder to look at the gannet on the other side. And as I craned my neck over, the gannet responded by doing the exact same thing and staring straight at me. And then it hit me, having seen them a little bit in, in their colonies, that that is usually the behavior that immediately precedes a fight breaking out. <laughs> so I caught myself. I realized what was about to happen, and I, I just scrunched my neck down and kind of like looked away. And the gannet went, all right, we're cool, and put its head back down, stuck it under the wing, and went back to sleep and was totally calm. So there's a lot of fighting in the colonies. Plus, I have heard reports of the way they kind of treat their elders um, there's there's reports and I'm not exactly sure where they come from it, it kind of eludes me now where I read this or where the study had been done but as Gannett's age obviously the repeated concussive inf- impacts on the water do begin to take their toll on the optic nerves so older Gannets we think start to go a bit blind but they still need to feed so what they do is follow the younger Gannets who still have good eyesight Obviously, Gannett's eyesight is fantastic, and it has to be because they're, you know, they're finding fish at like 30 to 70 meters above the water before they dive. So the older ones will, will get in line behind the younger ones and wait for them to dive just on the hope that they're diving in the right spot and they can end up getting themselves a fish as a result. That's right. Yeah. Unfortunately, the young ones don't seem to like this too much, and there are reports, stories of the younger ones feigning a dive over a cliff or a rocky ledge to get the older bird to dive with them. The younger bird will pull out of the dive. The older bird doesn't know that it's time to pull out of the dive and will end up hitting the rocks. Now, I I haven't witnessed this myself, but I, having worked a little bit around gannets and having watched them, I certainly don't put it past them at all, no. That is so sinister, yeah. right? <laughs> I recently read that the northern gannets in the Cape Mary population have been abandoning their chicks. It's happening at a rate that hasn't really been witnessed in any other colony around the world. About a third of chicks have been left behind. Have you heard about this? Yeah, so we had a really significant abandonment in, I believe it was 2012, was a, a really, really significant one. And uh, we think what it was related to was the scarcity of bait. It was a particularly warm year. The water temperature got very, very warm that year, uh, which is not good for these bait species. So either there were a lower biomass that year or the biomass was in a place that it wasn't normally. So the adults were having to travel a lot further in order to get the food to then return and regurgitate for their chicks. Now, that's the working theory, that, as I understand it. And obviously then the adults have to do a bit of a calculus that says, you know, if I'm I'm burning up X number of calories to get there and then get back, I have less food for my chick, I run the risk of starving myself, and if I don't survive, then there will be no more chicks from me. So maybe you let this one go and seabirds i think animals in general in the wild do have to kind of whether it's conscious or not they have to kind of do this little calculus uh when bait gets scarce when food gets scarce in general we see things like um lower birth rates it's it's nature basically taking the wheel so it's possible that that's kind of a live to fight another day sort of response we we haven't really got a full handle on it that year, there was also a significant petroleum incident in the Gulf of Mexico, which people may be aware of, which is where they winter, overwinter, and they feed a lot of these gannets at Cape St. Mary's will overwinter there and feed. If they arrived in the breeding colony already 
starving, then that could also have have affected what went on uh, at the colony that year. Uh, as far as I know, there haven't there was maybe one other year where there's a large abandonment, but that was the single biggest one. It was, yeah. It's pretty huge. Yeah. Whitless Bay in the surrounding area in Newfoundland attracts 350 different species of birds and more than 35 million seabirds each year. Why is it such an avian hotspot? I think Whitless Bay and colonies like it around Newfoundland and and in other spots, they have a perfect trifecta of, uh, I guess, conditions that allow large numbers of birds to inhabit there and attract large numbers of birds to inhabit those areas. You've got availability of bait. You have diversity in uh, habitat. And you also have a, a, uh, a situation in which there's very, very low predation. So in terms of bait, those waters have an unbelievable biomass of bait fish. I've already mentioned a couple earlier, the, the capelin, the sand lance, small crustaceans, things like that. The, and those bait sources are readily available, usually not that far away from these, these nesting colonies which is what you need to successfully raise a chick. So that's a huge part of it. And that's, that's why the birds are there, the seals are there, the whales are there, the dolphins are there. Everything comes there because of these bait species. Number two, you've got a really nice variety in habitat because all these different birds that inhabit it, you know, you've got puffins, guillemots, razorbill, um, northern fulmar, all sorts of different species, and they each kind of require different habitat. The puffins need big, steep, grassy slopes. Uh, the guillemots, kitty wakes, things like that, they need open rocky areas, cliff ledges, things like that. And that area, those islands there in the Willis Bay Ecological Reserve, they they allow for all of that. All of these different nesting sites are available to the different birds depending on their requirement. And because they are offshore islands, you get almost no terrestrial predators. So if you are a bird that has difficulty flying, that nests on the ground, in the case of puffins, you're living in holes in the ground, a few rats on an island like that can spell absolute doom for your your chicks, your eggs, things like that. Uh, these islands don't have that. And as a result of that, they are really, really, really great habitats for these, for these birds. Certainly a lot of them there. Apart from puffins and northern gannets, what are some of your other Whitless Bay favourites? Well, we have, I mean, we have quite a variety. I'm a big fan of razorbill auk. Um, That's actually a seagull? <laughs> The razorbills are some of my favorites. They, they just have a very proud stance, um, very jet black in color. I, I wish you could see what this guy was doing. <laughs> it's a fight breaking out over almonds. <laughs> so razorbills are some of my favorites. I, I love them. They have a great proud stance. Very, very beautiful birds, jet black. There's very comparatively very few of them as well, and you have to know exactly where they're nesting. Are you... One of the problems with that, that population is that most of the birds are black and white or some variation thereupon, right? As well, the, the guillemots, or as we call them, they're known in Canada as murs. They're known in Newfoundland as a tur. They basically look like little miniature penguins. They're quite funny, and they get in massive colonies on open rock ledges. And we're talking tens of thousands, just shoulder to shoulder, probably, you know four to six square inches of space per mating pair, plus their chick. It actually, you, you get there, it, it looks like the rocks are moving, wow. but it's just this unbelievable population of, of birds all gathered together in these massive big rookeries for safety because that's their protection. If a, a predator comes into the group, they all kind of stand shoulder to shoulder, and point their beaks at it. So you're diving into a pin cushion, basically. Wow. Yeah, it's really, really neat. There's amazing, amazing birds. There's also a fascinating population there that is probably the, I think it is, the most numerous breeding seabird in anywhere in North America, certainly in Newfoundland. Um, our most numerous breeding seabird is called a leech's storm petrel. And they're tiny little birds, about kind of sparrow-sized. They're very, very, very small little birds. 
and there's about 1.2 million of them living on the islands and in a season of six months i'd be very very lucky to see four or five of them yeah they're almost completely nocturnal they only come out in the daytime very very foggy days when they've got a lot of cover hence the name storm petrel it's because they prefer stormy weather because it they're very easy targets for for gulls and and things like that so they pretty much stay at home until just before dark they'll go out all night and fish they'll come back just before daybreak and it's a massive population of birds but these things are really cool like many birds in the petrel family with the tubular nostrils on top of the bill they have this wonderful disgusting ability to actually shoot a foul smelling waxy substance very oily out of this tubular nostril if they're threatened and they'll they'll fire this stuff up to a couple of meters away at their attacker now that Obviously, it's gross, but, you know, seabirds aren't necessarily too worried about gross. They do, you know, by and large, regurgitate food for their chicks. So, you know, there are varying degrees of gross. But this waxy substance can actually be lethal for uh, for other seabirds uh, because it disrupts the natural oils in their feathers and it ruins their waterproofing. If you ruin waterproofing of a pelagic seabird, then they can they can drown, they can die of hypothermia, all sorts of things they can't take off again once they're wet so you know they're small little innocuous looking little birds but they do have the potential to do quite a bit of damage by shooting this uh this foul smelling wax death by snot yeah you're exactly right yeah <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today justin absolute pleasure having you on pleasure chatting with you as always rochelle thank you for having me Thanks for joining us. Now, if you'd like to find out more about the bird life of Newfoundland, check out www.newfoundlandlabrador.com. And for more wildlife adventures and podcast episodes, be sure to check out faunographic.com. Catch you next time. Wild Lives by Faunographic. Check out our wildlife photo gallery at faunographic.com and on Instagram at faunographic. Mm.